Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Dolly Museum. We are very, very pleased to have you for a very special copy with a curator. And now I'd like to tell you about our speaker today, Stephen Kenny. He has created this extraordinary copy of our painting, Daddy Long Legs with the Evening Hope. It's absolutely amazing, and he's going to be talking about the, uh, the impulse to do this crazy and insane project and what he learned in the process. A little bit of background, Stephen's born 1962 in New York in uh, Peekskill. Peekskill? Peekskill. Um, he has his degree, his BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design, so from RISD back in 1984. Spent time in Rome, Italy on an um, independent study project which informed a lot of his uh, style. Uh, he has had many single artist shows including uh, recently the Lipa Ratner uh, Museum exhibition of all of his work, an overview, earlier this year. Also back in 2015, he did an exhibition at the University of South Florida on his black paintings. He's represented by a number of galleries here in the area and often participates not only in single artist shows, but also group shows internationally. And he traveled with us to um, Italy a number of years ago, to actually Paris, um, when he was bringing one of his paintings for an overseas exhibition. He's been written about quite a bit, including an article in the DuPont Registry by uh, David Warner. Um, also, Jennifer Ring in Creative Loping, Loafing earlier this year. And he is uh, featured on one of the Pinellas, uh, Creative Pinellas podcasts with Barbara St. Clair. And he has, he's, and also he was in the, uh, the exhibition, The Exquisite Porch, which we heard Amanda Cooper from the Morian Arts Center talking about. He started as an illustrator prior to going into the fine art world, and two things you may be familiar with him for are uh, some of the celestial seasoning images that are out there were created by him, and also one of the very early Journey album covers was done by Stephen. So with those few pointers as to the world of Stephen Kenny, I now invite you to join me in welcoming Stephen. Oh, thank you. Thank you, can you hear me? Um, thank you all very much for being here today. I've uh, been really looking forward to this talk quite a bit. So when I started this painting, I had no idea it was going to be a uh, Coffee with a Curator talk, so that was a, a wonderful um, thing to happen. So I want to thank the Dali Museum for inviting me to do this, and uh, specifically Joan Croft, and Kathy White, Peter Tush, and Shana Buckles Harkness, who's the librarian here at the museum, uh, for encouraging me and helping me along the way. Um, Peter talked a little bit about my background. Uh, I don't know if I need to say any more about that necessarily, but I'll mention things as we go along. Um, Peter, can you set up the uh, presentation view on the side, the slides? Uh, actually, I can't, but first we just talk Okay, about all right. <laughs> Um, I've never made a copy before of a painting, so this was quite uh, an adventure. And the analogy that came to mind while I was working on it, I'm sure everyone has tried to uh, copy someone else's signature at some point, you know? <laughs> in, in, uh, completely innocently, I'm sure. But, um, you know, after a couple of hours, you can usually get it. Um, imagine a 400-page handwritten manuscript and trying to copy that uh, word for word all the way to the end. That's kind of what this whole experience was like. Um, in the very beginning, before I started it, I estimated overconfidently that it would take me about three months working on it in between other projects and that sort of thing. It eventually, in the end, took 19 months. And there were periods during that time where I would just turn it to the wall and curse Dali for being so relentlessly, excellent, thank you. Um, so relentlessly uh, detailed and fanatical and all those things, but uh, I made it to the end. Um, I'm not an art historian. Uh, uh, I'm a painter. Um, art historians typically are not painters. So I've read my share of art uh, biographies, and uh, it's amazing how many art historians get it wrong, the, you know, the painting aspect of uh, what artists do. They try, but um, I've found very few who really can get inside 
the head of the, the artist that they're writing about. Um, so what I'm going to do today, what I'm not going to talk about is what you probably already know, hopefully, about the painting. If you've ever gone on a docent tour or listened to the, um, the audio uh, guide, um, those are the things I'm not going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about is my experience of having painted this painting and the revelations that came to mind and the associations and, and all that sort of thing. So I'm going to start with a quote by Dali that kind of, in a nutshell, in, uh, sort of uh, talks about the entire experience. He said, the day that people begin to study my work seriously, they will see that my painting is like an iceberg, of which only one-tenth of its volume is visible. And he kind of stole that from Freud, talking about the psyche, you know, the conscious and the unconscious. But um, in this case, it was, it was absolutely true. I thought I knew this painting very well until I started actually copying it. And then this talk is about everything else that followed. Uh, another theme that runs through this is the idea of how we store images that we see especially, I think, artists, and uh, Dali talked about this too. Um, and I'll show a couple of examples from my own career of um, stored images finding their way into my paintings without me consciously or intentionally uh, willing it to happen. Um, and I wondered the whole time I was painting this how often that was going on with Dali's process too. You know, was he consciously referring to these other artists and works of art? or was it unconscious on his part? And he said, all the wonderful images of your vanished time, those which you looked at without seeing them, have nevertheless remained intact, kept like a blind rosary along the combustible wick, which you keep folded in intricate convolutions like an intestine, inside the monstrous hump of your painter's head. So, He's making that comparison between a camel storing water in its hump and artists storing images. And um, uh, so one thing I wanted to do was go and look at the things that he was looking at as, as a boy. And luckily, thanks to uh, Wally Shearburn, who just re recently passed away, he was a volunteer and a docent here, he had started collecting the Gowans art books, which we have, there, there were 52 published altogether. We have, I think, 50 now upstairs, and Shana, the librarian, allowed me to go through these. They're incredibly fragile. But it was fascinating to hold them in my hands and look through the books that Dali had. Uh, I think by the age of nine, he had all of them. So, and he said he had pretty much memorized every single image. So he had all of that stored in his head. These are a few of his heroes. Raphael, he talks a lot about. Velazquez, he called a genius. Um, the early Dutch painters. My Earliest experience with a Dali original was at uh, art school at RISD, and it was this painting, the, the Nostalgic Echo. So I spent a lot of time looking at it, uh, the four years that I was there, and um, again, it, it sank into my memory. It's a very typical painting of Dali's with the weathered wall, um, the perforations in the wall, uh, looking through to the landscape behind. You've got the long shadows. Uh, the black silhouettes of the figures and the sort of barren ground, all very typical of Dali's work. One of the first paintings I did after I graduated was this one, not consciously thinking of that painting, but all, this, it, all the same elements are there, the this weathered wall with the opening in it to the landscape behind, the barren ground, the long shadows, the black silhouettes, and I even threw in the Lincoln uh, probably from upstairs, too, without thinking much about it. And another example that came to mind very recently was um, another painting that was in the museum's collection, that Frank Benson painting from 1909, which I had to pass by all the time every time I went into the museum. I never thought much about it at the time. I, I never spent a lot of time looking at it. But um, fast forward to 2003, and I did the painting on the right, The Attendant. And um, within the last couple of months, I saw the Benson painting again. And when I saw it again, I was immediately struck by how similar these two are. And if you take the, 
seated figures out of the Benson painting and turn her around, it's shockingly similar. Um, I mean, to the degree that it is. Uh, the direction of the light, the, the, her pose, that land, that land uh, mass sticking out into the water, the um, uh, angle of the land behind her. Um, so this sort of thing is just totally fascinates me. So why did I choose the Daddy Long Legs painting? Um, a lot of reasons. Here's, these are four. Uh, it's important because it was the first painting that the Morses bought for their collection in 1943. Um, it was the first painting he did after leaving Spain prior to World War II and right after the Spanish Civil War. Um, and um, it's, it's incredibly rich with all sorts of symbolism, um, references, um, artistic styles. Uh, and that goes to the last point being that um, this one painting has so many different painting styles in it. And I think it does because, because it was the first painting he did when he came to the States, I think he really wanted to show off all of his technical ability uh, in one painting. And uh, I think it, it also just reveals himself as much as he possibly could, uh, maybe more so than any other painting. So in that sense, it's a real masterpiece in my, in my mind. Um, in the painting, you've got, as I said, all the different sort of painting styles. And they, uh, to me, uh, you can directly reference them to other artists that he really admired. Um, Ang, Da Vinci, Raphael. Vermeer and Velazquez, and um, uh, he talked about all these artists very much um, and admired them very much. And in the painting itself, you can see in the upper left the portion of the sky that's sort of blended seamlessly. There's no visible brush strokes. It's incredibly smooth. Um, below that is a detail of the uh, victory of Samothrace in the painting. Uh, there's actually very little paint on that. You're looking through to what's called the imprimatura layer, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Later, the horse is incredibly. This is the part that probably drove me near insanity. Um, it's incredibly, incredibly detailed with these little jewel-like drops of microscopic paint that um, just completely baffled me. And uh, the quarter there gives you a sense of how the, the scale of that. Um, in the main figure, the skin is blended beautifully, and there's incredibly subtle variations of color. Um, and then uh, down below that, the close-up of the, the, uh, the head, uh, we see incredibly delicate, wispy uh, brush strokes in the eyelashes and, and that sort of thing. Uh, one artist Dolly didn't talk a lot about, not that I am aware of anyway, is Bosch. And as far as I'm concerned, if his painting style is closest to any particular artist, it would be Bosch. Uh, they both, in my, I consider them both more draftsmen than painters, actually, because of the, the way they applied their paint. If you look closely at uh, Bosch's work, it's, it's, the paint is drawn on with very, mostly very fine, uh, fine, fine brushes, and Dali, too, worked that way a lot. The, I think the reason he, respected Velazquez so much is that Dali couldn't paint like Velazquez. Velazquez's work is very bold, very buttery. Um, Dali's temperament, I don't think, allowed him to do that. That's why he uh, admired Velazquez so much. Um, if you want to find the highest concentration of Bosch paintings anywhere in the world, you would go to the Prado. And that is a 15-minute walk from where Dali went to art school. So I'm sure he spent a lot of time there. Um, maybe he was even required to. And I'm, I'm sure spent a lot of time looking at Bosch's work while he was there. Um, I said I've never copied a painting of Dali before, but I've mimicked his style. <laughs> this was, uh, as Peter said, I started out as a um, commercial illustrator. And when I did, when I started, now, you have to remember this was before Photoshop. Photoshop didn't even exist, if you can imagine that. Um, 
so if a client wanted a surreal image, they'd have to hire someone like me. So, um, and there was a lot of work out there at the time, um, clients needing images that looked like Dolly had painted them. So uh, that was a, a big part of my um, reputation. So this was actually a sample I did. So I, I just threw every uh, Dolly reference I could <laughs> into the painting, including, again, the, the weathered stone walls, the limp phallus, the crutch, reference to Freud there in the book, the limp watch, the uh, uh, inkwell, the landscape in the background, the fishing boat, loaf of bread, and, of course, his, uh, his uh, portrait. And that's the, his torso is taken from a, a Durer painting. These are a couple more actual illustrations that I was hired to do. Um, again, the client wanted the illustration to look like Dolly had painted it, so I just, again, took all the uh, various references I could and threw them in there. Copying paintings has a long tradition. Um, this was an illustration. Homer actually started as a, Winslow Homer started as an illustrator too. Um, this is a, a scene uh, uh, inside the Louvre of artists copying paintings there, which you can still do. This is a, a more recent photo of a young artist doing just that. Um, you can't do it here. Um, there's just not enough room. You need very large spaces to be able to set up an easel and not have people bumping into you and that sort of thing. So uh, it, it just wouldn't work here. That's why I couldn't uh, you know, work from the original here in the museum. Dali did a copy of uh, one of his heroes, uh, Vermeer's Lace Maker. And the interesting thing about these two slides is that um, the one on the right obviously is very close to the the way it looks in the, in the Louvre, Dali must have been working. We know he didn't go, he did go another time but, uh, uh, to paint, but it wasn't this painting. He had to have been working from some sort of reproduced, reprodu uh, you know, something out of a book or a magazine. And the, the, one, of, one of the giveaways is the color because uh, you know, if you look at a lot of those old magazines and things, the printing processes back then were not what they are today, so the color was horrible. So I'm sure he copied the photograph precisely, but since he didn't have access to the original, he couldn't uh, really nail it. So where did I go to get my image to work from? Since I couldn't paint in the gallery, I had to find one to use in my studio. Books were out of the question because they were, the images were just too small. I couldn't see the detail I was gonna need to see. So I went online and when you Google Daddy Long Legs of the Evening Hope, you get a wide variety of images, um, all different contrasts. Uh, some of them are hot, some of them are cool. Some of them aren't even the same. They've been stretched, so they're not even the same dimensions. Um, but I did find one, which is thankfully the, the museum's own image. And lo and behold, it was a high resolution image, so I could blow it up and really see the detail that I needed to see. So I was very lucky there. So now I'm ready to start, and um, I wanted to do a little more research, so I went back to Dolly's 50 Secrets of Magic Craftsmanship, and it was the second time I had read it. I had read it once before, and I'm glad I read it again, because I got a lot more out of it. There's actually more information in it than I thought the first time. Um, it's about 200 pages long. The first 100 pages are filled with Dolly's, um, uh, you've got to get through that to get to the, the meat of the book. Um, and one of the things he talked about, and he, sp and he spends 12 pages talking about this uh, Arenarium, and he said every artist must have this device in their studios. And you go about making each of those hoops with an olive branch, you coerce a spider to come along and build a web in it. <laughs> the little box below it is with the holes is where the spider lives. And he's only got four of them there, but he said you have to have five. And then at the end on the left is a, it looks like a ball there, a crystal ball. But he said a crystal bowl filled with water and you line all these things up and you get the morning dew to sparkle on the webs and you look through it 
And that's his way of burning images into your mind, into your memory. Um, so you can do that if you want. Um, he talks about brushes, uh, which is helpful. Um, you know, if, but if you're going to this book to learn how to paint, you're not going to learn how to paint. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, the brushes. All of these different areas of the painting are done using each of those different brushes. So he obviously employed the full range of brushes available. He gives us two lists of oil colors. One is the uh, list of colors unsuitable for uh, artistic painting on the left. And the other one is a list of permanent colors which can be used with confidence. And the, the confident list, um, a lot of those I recognize. You can still find those and buy them. The one on the left, I was, I don't, they're just, I guess they were so unsuitable that they're not even made anymore. And there's one towards the bottom uh, called Egyptian mummy. Does anybody know what Egyptian mummy paint is made from? What? Mummies. Mummies, you're right. <laughs> and uh, it's not made anymore because they ran out of mummies. <laughs> Literally. It was some sort of brownish color. Not surprising. He um, raves about amber painting solution and uh, Blocks is a company that he really admired a lot. They make paint and all sorts of things. And you can still get it. A little tube of 25 millimeters is $179. Uh, I used Winsor Newton Liquin, which is a much cheaper alternative. Uh, he wouldn't have liked the fact that I was using Liquin, because Liquin has a dryer in it. So it speeds up the drying process. And he was very big on letting paintings dry naturally. So his medium. Liquin was my medium. His medium was always some form of oil, whether linseed or uh, uh, there's a lot of different ones that you can use. Um, his painting is on canvas. Um, the one that's showing there is actually uh, linen, and you can tell because it's got that brownish grayish tone. So you're looking at the back. Uh, the, the canvas is stapled to or nailed to stretcher bars, wooden stretcher bars. And Dali, for the most part, as far as I can tell, always used uh, factory primed canvas. He didn't do it himself. So he, the canvas came to him ready to paint on. Um, and I included that image on the left, the little figure from the painting. It's got a hairline crack running down. And this happens all the time to paintings. If something presses on the front of the canvas and the canvas is, the painting is old, it'll crack right along where that wooden stretcher bar is behind. It happens all the time. So that, that tells you that there's a wooden stretcher bar behind the, uh, behind the canvas. Uh, this is mine. Um, it looks crooked there, but it's actually not. Um, and I was working on canvas, factory primes canvas, like Dali. Um, then when it came to getting the image, Dali's image, onto my canvas when I was ready, I used an opaque projector, that's it on the left. And I printed out a small black and white image of the painting, Dali's painting, darkened my studio, put the image in my opaque projector and projected it down onto my canvas. And um, so you can see that on the right, kind of dark at the bottom. At the top is my laptop with the high resolution image. So as I was tracing Dali's painting, I was able to go in and look more closely at uh, his painting to get the details, because the projection is fairly uh, fuzzy. And one thing, uh, you know, it's funny. Dali, he talks about some things so much all the time. There are certain things he doesn't talk about. Um, and one of those is projection. And if you know what to look for, you can go upstairs and see that he projected a lot to get his images on, especially on the larger uh, the masterworks in the, in the collection upstairs. Um, and I found a couple of images of him with his uh, projector. Uh, the one on the bottom is not his. It's, it's just one that I found online that's kind of similar. Um, and I should say, projection, until very recently, has always been looked down upon as cheating. So this is my sketch on my canvas. And it looks a little gray, but it's actually stark white. So. Uh, that was done. One of the first little um, 
things that I realized was I had to use a, a straight edge or a ruler to do those, the horizons in the background and the, uh, that walled little wall in the foreground. That's not a big revelation, but um, we know that he did that. And um, as far as composing the composition, one thing Dali was aware of and used, uh, utilized a lot was something called armatures. And these go back to the Renaissance. And an armature basically is a grid that you use to arrange the elements in your painting. And what it does is sort of unconsciously uh, tell the viewer that everything is orderly. Um, and uh, you know, rather than just randomly placing images all over, the, all over the canvas, you align them to the, the grids, the lines on the grid. And if you look at our Nature Mort Vivant upstairs from an angle, you can see uh, the armature underneath. Dolly actually sort of incised it into the, uh, the gesso uh, beneath the canvas. So a lot of those objects actually line up with the, the lines on the grid. And this is just another example of one that he did where it's, he was just making it uh, as obvious as possible. Um, and as far as the daddy long legs, um, it seems to me that he used sort of this sort of fan-like arrangement. And um, it, it helps your eye sort of move from left to right across the painting and gives you a sense that there's a rhythm there and an order. And even he added that other diagonal in the other direction to sort of lock all those pieces in place and, and help it give it stability. So we're back to my tracing. And earlier I mentioned imprimatura. And an imprimatura is a transparent wash that you apply to the bare white canvas to tone down that whiteness. Because if you start painting directly on it, that, that white will ultimately shine through the paint and, and affect um, how the paint appears. So you tone it all down with uh, different artists use different colors, sometimes gray, sometimes brown, sometimes even red or green, depending on the artist. So I applied that. And if you go upstairs, you can see um, instances very, very clearly where his uh, imprimatur is uh, visible. Um, in the St. Helena of Port Legat, that whole foreground is nothing but imprimatura. He just had the sense to just say, that's, that's fine, it looks great, I'm not gonna do anything more to it. And the only paint is in the clouds and the water and the uh, gala over there on the right. And, okay, so I started uh, painting and I started with the background, which in this sort of painting is the best way to start because um, you want to end with the objects that are closest to you or, or in the foreground. And um, when I um, came to paint that sky in the water, I went through the blues that I have uh, in my studio, and none of them were quite right. But I had this one tube that was kind of an orphan tube. Somebody had given it to me probably 20 years ago, and I'd never used it because I didn't recognize the, the company name. I thought it was just a junky. Uh, brand of paint. But I squeezed a little bit out on my palette and it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. And the, uh, the paint company was called Shiva and uh, went on to Google and Googled Shiva Paint Company. Lo and behold, there was a young man born in Barcelona wow. in the late 1800s. He moved to the United States. He was an artist. He wanted to make his own brand of paint that was the highest quality possible. And in the 40s and 50s in the United States, Shiva Paint Company was the number one producer of oil paint. <laughs> Go figure. So, more work. Um, and I'll toggle back and forth as we go so you can see kind of what I'm working on. So I finished the background, working on the cannon, got that fairly far along, did a little work on the horse and the plane and the victory of Samothrace. I put in the uh, ink wells at the top of the body, did a little work on the tree and started painting in the, the ground. And while I was working on the cannon, um, naturally, oops, yeah. 
Um, I naturally thought of uh, De Chirico. Um, it's been said very often that uh, Dali's inspiration for that was probably De Chirico. And, um, and again, if you look at the De Chirico painting too, the background, it's that same bleak, barren ground, the long shadows. Um, we were in uh, New York recently and went to the Museum of Modern Art. They have a great selection, collection of De Chirico's and the, uh, the inspiration is so stark, so, so apparent. Um, so I don't, I don't disagree with that. I think he probably was thinking about that. But another thing that came to mind was uh, Goya's series of prints uh, called The Disasters of War. And although this doesn't resemble it visually, it started me thinking about uh, that whole series of prints that Goya made. And there's other references that will come up to that too. So I'm wondering if Dali was, had that in mind. Back to the painting. Um, working more on the horse. And this was starting to be the point where I was thinking about giving up because it was just <laughs> getting crazy. And uh, so working on the horse, naturally I was reminded of all the different rotting horses that Dali has <laughs> painted, or the top one is uh, from uh, Ancien Andalou. And um, so earlier in his career, they were very prevalent. Um, so it's not surprising that he would use that again. And, but then I, uh, again, back to Goya's Disasters of War, there was this print that's part of the collection. And the, to me, the horse is um, uh, very similar, especially if you look at the head, the way the teeth are, the mouth is open, the teeth are sticking out. Um, and uh, it's being about to be torn apart by uh, um, dogs there. And the, the, the series of Goya's prints are all about the, the Spanish war with uh, Napoleon's armies and all of the horrendous things that, that happened during that. So back to the painting. Now working on the airplane, the limp airplane, which um, anytime you see anything limp, it probably has a reference to Dali's impotence. And uh, coincidentally, it's emerging from the plane right at the sort of crotch area of the horse. Um, so I was working more on the statue. And um, when I was working on the statue, I was reminded of the sort of education he would have gone through, which was very classical, very rigorous. Students at that time in art school spent their first, uh, they started by probably drawing from prints and even tracing prints of statues. Then they would move on to working from plaster casts. And um, so any art school worth its salt would have these plaster casts of uh, well-known sculptures for the students to copy from. So I'm sure he must have done that when he was uh, in school. And um, the, on the right is just a catalog from a company in Boston that pr or produced these plaster casts that you could order from and um, you know, in different sizes and all that sort of thing. So that's what art schools were doing at the time. This is um, just an image I found on the internet of a classroom. And you can see the Venus de Milo there. Uh, could very well be that there was one of those at the San Fernando Royal Academy of Art II that he worked from. And we know how much the Venus de Milo uh, resurfaces in his work through the years. And I also got thinking about what's called the uh, écorché model. And if you speak French, écorché uh, is a reference to flaying, so removing the skin. And these figures, again, were everywhere. And they were designed to teach about anatomy and muscles, uh, structure and all that sort of thing. And even though um, we talk about the victory of Samothrace figures being wrapped in bandages, to me, there's just a, a very strong uh, visual analogy going on there. So that's another thing I was wondering about. Again, all of this is just speculation on my point. It's, uh, I have no uh, proof of any of this, but it, it was what was going through my mind while I was working on the painting. I also did uh, work on the tree on the right-hand side, which we know 
reappears in other Dali paintings. Um, back to the painting. And I started doing more work on, well, I did uh, the little figure in the corner and then the head and the torso of the main figure. Now, in case you don't know, the, um, the, the head on the ground, Dolly called the great masturbator and uh, declared it a self-portrait. So um, whenever you see that, obviously it's a reference to him. The unusual part of this particular painting is that the figure up at the top, which we'll get to, has two breasts. So, you know, um, you have to wonder what, uh, what uh, he was saying there. And the inkwells at the top um, kind of mirror the, uh, the breasts that they're near. But as I was working on that little figure in the corner, um, I got, was reminded of da Vinci's Virgin of the Rocks painting, one of uh, Dali's, again, heroes. This is in the Louvre, where he did spend a lot of time. And the poses are just so similar. Um, Consciously or unconsciously, I, you know, I wonder if he was thinking about that. The other connection is that um, that's Jesus sitting on the ground, and he's pointing over to John the Baptist. And in the Catholic Church, John the Baptist is considered a precursor for Jesus and possibly even uh, uh, baptized him. So I'm wondering if there was some connection there, too, with Dali's older brother, his dead older brother. Um, because if you look, go back to the Gowan's uh, art books and look through the volume on Raphael, there are 11 paintings of uh, the Holy Family with St. John the Baptist and Jesus together. So um, that's curious. Back to the painting, working more on the main figure, sort of the torso area and the arm. And I couldn't help but go back again to the disasters of war, uh, especially this particular one. Uh, to me, they're very similar in a lot of ways. You've got the almost dead tree in Goya's and these emaciated, uh, you know, gory, um, uh, dismembered bodies. Um, you know, to remind you again, Spain had just ended their Spanish Civil War and all the brutality that ensued. And um, uh, the, the Goya's uh, disasters of war are all about the, the, uh, the war with Napoleon in Spain. And once more, I had to go back and think about the uh, Écorché figure. If you look at the, um, the torso area of the Dali, it looks <laughs> so similar to that armpit of the écorché figure. And if you look at the arm that's hanging down in the Dali, it looks incredibly similar to the, the figure's left arm. That's what the same sinewy, um, muscly sort of look to it. And lo and behold, there's the tree, the dead tree by its side. Um, so you have to wonder. Let's see, uh, back to the painting, working a little bit more. Now working on those two breasts at the top and filling in more of the torso. And couldn't help thinking about da Vinci's anatomical drawings too, which uh, again, you know, one of Dali's heroes, I'm sure he was well aware of these. Uh, working again on the Figure moving on to the starting to work on the uh, uh, Dolly called it the uh, violin cello, so I started uh, putting that in. But before I get to that, <laughs> I'm going to tell you to turn off your phone. Um, uh, before I uh, switch gears and, and move on to the um, the frame, which I knew I was and wanted to do as well, not just the painting. So. Um, Again, I couldn't get into the gallery with a tape measure and, and measure it on the wall and that sort of thing. So I took a photograph of the whole thing. And knowing the dimensions of the painting itself, it was easy to figure out the dimensions of all the other different parts. 
And uh, this is just a little sketch I made in my notebook. And you can see uh, it's showing the glass and then all the different, there's a, a concave area and a convex area and then uh, the other details running across. And here you can see it. Um, and those detailed strips, the wave fillets, I knew they were going to give me trouble. Um, I did everything I could to find them. Find, uh, looked online at framing supply companies. I went to a framer and asked if they had any access to uh, buying those. And I came up empty. So I finally had to just admit that I was going to have to make them. And uh, they're all about a quarter, three quarters of an inch wide, and I was going to need 46 feet altogether. So to make those, I cut my little strips of wood and with a round file made the crosswise grooves. And then with a V-shaped gouge made the lengthwise grooves. And uh, was really just trying to get the, the impression of what the, the wave fillets look like. They're, they're not the same by any means. but. Um, I got it close. And all the rest of the pieces, too, I had to make from hand. So um, there's uh, the other sections. And here's a picture of the back of the frame. And the open area is where the painting will eventually go. And then I start building the front, starting from the outside in. And then each of the different Details get glued in, uh, everything, everything is glued, and the painting is essentially hollow. You can see how everything is just uh, propped up. Oops. Adding more pieces, uh, getting closer, and then um, that's the frame wall put together with just a coat of black spray paint over the top to, to start adding the color. And you can see, I don't know, it's hard to see. You may see a couple of little like wormholes in there. That was the beginning of the distressing uh, process because if you look at the original frame upstairs, it's, it's, it's been through a lot over the years. So after having put all this effort into creating this frame, I then had to nearly destroy it <laughs> to get it to look like the one upstairs which was kind of fun, but kind of scary at the same time. And the color of the one upstairs is very tricky to get. It's kind of like this brownish, grayish, in-between color. So back to the painting. Um, again, working on the, uh, the head of the violin cello, and then filling in the area of that curious walled section on the right. And when I was working on that, I got thinking about what's called a hortus conclusus. And that was, it's basically just a walled garden, but this was a really popular theme in the late medieval, early Renaissance periods. And typically they are walled gardens with uh, the Madonna and child sitting in the center. And it's, this one's kind of funny. Jesus is on the ground there sort of strumming on a zither or whatever that is. With his, it's funny, he's got like a purse hanging from his belt. I'm not sure what he's got in there. But the garden is in full bloom. You've got uh, flowers everywhere. The trees are fruiting. You've got a guy on the left picking fruit. Uh, you've got an angel hanging out on the right side, sitting on the grass, taking a break. And, um, but uh, everything is just, in its place, orderly, beautiful, peaceful. It's this uh, wonderful, enclosed, restful place. And what's interesting, which I didn't notice at first, but oops, right here, there's a little like monkey figure. So the devil is never far away. Um, going back to Bosch, this isn't his work, but um, he came from a family of painters. They were very involved in uh, illuminated manuscripts. And um, I'm sure everyone has seen uh, lots of these, and they usually consist of actually you know, the text around the central panel, which is the 
sort of illustration of the text. And then on the outside of that, you've got the decorated border. And there's a name for the figures that are used in those, and they're called drolleries. And um, they're very often surreal, uh, very often gruesome, but um, very playful at the same time. So I got thinking about, uh, was that in Dali's mind? And I think that a possibility is that he, what he's done here is taken the Hortus Conclusus and pushed it off to the side. And the tree is dead. There's nothing growing in it anymore. And we're now outside that protected area. Um, and going back to the Freud quote uh, about you know, the, the iceberg, the, the tip being um, the, the conscious mind, and the larger nine-tenths that we can't see the subconscious, Dali spent all of his time in the subconscious. Um, so I think he's, he's taking us there. And uh, we're now surrounded by all of these grotesque and gruesome drolleries, in a way, um, to the point where the, uh, the little boy is covering his face uh, out of uh, horror, possibly, at this entire scene in front of him. And um, moving on to the, the violoncello, um, typically they have four tuning pegs because they have four strings. But what Dolly's done is given us, well, no tuning pegs at all, actually. And what looks like a, to me, it looks like a little tiny uh, scrotum. Um, and uh, if you look at the, again, going back to the, the whole idea of limpness, um, again, like the airplane and the horse, where it's originating from the crotch area of the horse, the violoncello is emanating from the crotch of the figure. Um, so uh, I can't help but think he's making a reference again to his impotence. Um, the whole idea that there are no strings on the uh, violoncello, it's, it's limp, there aren't any tuning pegs, so you can't play it. It's impossible to play it. So he's unable to play his instrument, um, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so from there, kept going, working a little bit more on the violoncello and the feet beneath it. And uh, while I was working on the violoncello, I, I got thinking about Bosch again. And uh, if you, uh, this is taken from the Garden of Earthly Delights, which was in the Prado in uh, Madrid. Whenever Bosch painted an instrument, they were never really playable either. They were always more instruments of torture. Um, and at the time when he was active, uh, secular music was very looked down upon by the church. It was uh, dangerous. You know, it got people uh, singing and dancing and uh, drinking and just having a good time. So that was very discouraged uh, by the church. And then I found that drawing on the right of the vagabonds playing a hurdy-gurdy, like the one in Bosch's painting. And curiously, there are the crutches again um, that appear so often in Dali's work, too. Then we get to the little figures all the way in the back. And I've never heard him say anything about them. I've never read anything written as to what they might be. But to me, they look like two male figures. And they seem to be carrying something on their shoulders, which to me, the first thing that comes to mind is Sisyphus. And Dali did this print for the, as part of his uh, Divine Comedy series in 57. And if you look closely, it's actually two, two male figures together. Uh, one is sort of kneeling behind the other, and their heads are touching, and you have more of that sinuous sort of flayed uh, body part going on. Um, just another example of uh, something that was done during the Renaissance, well, actually the Baroque period by Guercino. And I find the drawing styles very similar. Uh, I mentioned that I consider Dali more of a draftsman than a painter. And when he was young, he went uh, 
spent many years drawing after school and uh, as part of his early education. So he had a lot of drawing background. Just a few more examples of similar figures, not necessarily uh, Sisyphus. but So I finished those, moved on to the, the great masturbator. And um, to get those ants in the right place, I literally, I made a template. Uh, um, not a template, a um, stencil. So I printed out the head, the same size that it was in my painting, and with an X-Acto blade, cut out, not all of them, but a lot of the, the ants, held it up to the painting, and sort of marked them all, and from there was able to fill them all in and get them all in the right place. Um, and didn't notice until looking at the image blown up that there's uh, a little bit of blood trickling out of the nose there. And I don't know if how many of you have ever noticed, but the daddy long legs only has seven legs. And the eighth one is, it's there, but it's this little shriveled up little uh, appendage. So this is my final finished painting. And uh, 19 months later, <laughs> and um, uh, I'll, and by just uh, leaving this slide up, those are all the different stages that we looked through. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer questions about the painting. So, yeah. Do you know how long Dali spent painting that? I would guess, uh, I would guess a few months. I don't know. I don't know if there's any records um, about that. Um, Peter, jump in if I'm getting anything wrong. Um, yes? Two questions about your painting process. You were saying that there was such small detail. Did you find you had to work under magnification, like a jeweler visor or um, scope? I know that he did at times. I didn't. You didn't? No. Um, and the other question is, after going through this and doing it, usually there's a learning process. <coughs> is there something, if you were doing it today, that you would do differently than... How you did this. I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> not, not this one. I'd pick a simpler one. Okay. <laughs> yes? So Dali is nothing if not a mysterious personality and figure in our history. After going into the minutia and the detail of this drawing, of this painting, uh, did you come away unlocking any mysteries about Dali? Um, well, more than anything, I got to feel as though I knew him and his personality better. Um, and my wife is a, a clinical psychologist, so we've had lots of talks about <laughs> him and uh, where he's at. And um, uh, he had his issues, that's for sure. But he, above all, he was probably just a genius with a lot of energy because he, he really wore me down um, <laughs> trying to copy this. It was, it was relentless, his, his attention to detail, his, the degree to which he took the various elements of the painting. Um, I just got such a sense of the, the force um, behind this painting and, and a lot of the other ones, too. There was, he was unstoppable. Yes? Uh, <laughs> in my own subconscious, or his? Um, yeah, I was definitely in his quite a bit, and it was, a, it was an intense place, very intense, that's for sure. Um, so, that's, uh, yes? And where will your painting be on display? It'll just stay in my studio, uh, unless, Somebody wants to put it on display somewhere, but um, yeah, I, I have it hanging on the wall right over my desk, so I look at it every day and uh, 
John? Two things. Um, given all the images of incidents in the painting, when I do a tour, I usually say, here's a cannon, here's one ball, there's probably another one just off the frame, if they're grown-ups. Agent Dr. Freud, Agent Dr. Freud, and then I move on. Um, is, I, know that, I knew the, the Carrico reference. Is, is that a fair estimation that that's a phallus and one testicle, or should I back off on that? I th I, personally, I think that's perfectly valid. T uh, Peter? Um, there's something down there, but it looks, uh, it's thicker. It looks more like a snake. Um, there is, uh, it didn't strike me as, as the leg, um, cause the legs are just hairline, uh, brush strokes. So, and the thing down there is, is thicker. So, but anyway, yes, Craig. I just, I know we talked about this, but I just want to thank you for allowing us to be a part of this journey because those of us who have looked at these paintings for decades, we're seeing new things and you've kind of given us that guide. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. welcome. Thank you. Just as a follow-up, what is your next big project? <laughs> The next, I'm, I'm dying to get back to my own work. Um, I've got a lot of commissions at the moment and uh, they're not letting me do that. And actually, Peter mentioned me working with Celestial Seasonings. They just contacted me again uh, the other day, wanting me to do two more boxes and I just don't have time. I, I can do one, but uh, so I have to work through my commissions before I can get back to my own work. Yes? Uh, well, the journey was the last one that uh, Steve Perry was part of, the lead singer. It's called Trial by Fire. And uh, that was fun because they just let me do whatever I wanted to do. They gave me the, the lyrics to all the songs, but I didn't know the, what the music sounded like, and they just said, do whatever you want. Um, and that was a very Dali-esque painting, too. The um, Celestial Seasonings, the latest ones, I've done 10 now, I think, and the two that are out on the shelves now, one is called Citrus Sunrise, that's the new one, and then the other one is called uh, Lovely Lavender Lane. <laughs> yes? Yeah. You compared two paintings, uh, Velasquez and um, uh, Dolly, and you said that maybe had gotten a hold of one that was the color balance was off. Mm. Is it possible, since he painted in 1955, I looked at the date, is it mm. possible that painting was after that date, enlightened Sure, sure. Because I think that that, I don't know, I know in the late 70s and 80s they started conserving and people were like, oh, you're ruining the Rembrandt and Sistine Chapel and things like that. But no, no that's, yeah, that that's a real possibility. Because sure. that color of that years of right. build-up. I didn't think about that. Yeah. You're right. Anybody else? Yes. It's, um, it's just uh, a really important one in his whole uh, oeuvre. Um, and as a docent, you know, I've been a docent here for six years now, it's the one we start with. So I look at it all the time, I think about it all the time, and I talk about it all the time. And again, and also since he, this was the first one he did coming to the United States, I really think he put, he pulled out all the stops when he was working on this and really wanted it to be um, impressive to the American public, and uh, so I, and I just think there's a lot of a lot of reasons why it's so important. Yes. What is below the cannon? That dark sort of a circle. Yeah. The, it's a cannonball. 
This? Yeah, it's a cannonball. With so. a shadow. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it doesn't have any highlights on it, or so it doesn't look round, but that's what it's supposed to be. Yes? Can we talk about forgery for a moment? <laughs> 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 no, no. There's a line there. Uh, I think as long as I'm doing this for my own entertainment, uh, I'm okay. But if I was, yeah. Well, you go back to the greats. That's how they learned, was copying the masters. Right, commonly, right. And in Europe, a commonly done thing. If, if you go to the Louvre, or I don't know about the rules in the Louvre, but in the Met, you have to do it a different size, <clears throat> either 10% smaller or 10% bigger, I think, to make sure that it's, but mine is exactly the same. <laughs> Did I sign it? Yes. Um, Did you sign it, Donald? It's down here. I don't know if it's in this slide, but yeah, Stephen Kenny. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Cap, I, I bought a clip, a clip on the streets in Frankfurt, Germany, and it was a Russian artist, and I said, oh, it's, you know, it looked a lot like it. I'd seen the original, so I knew it wasn't, but, and he didn't sign it. And I said, oh, but you sign it. He said, no, I can't sign it. It's hmm. He's untraceable. <laughs> hmm. Well, they're, they're going to come right to my door. I'm sorry? Are you not allowed to sign something that's a copy? Well, definitely not sign it with the original painter's name. <laughs> that's, that's a no. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you.